I remember a little over two years ago, um, our leadership team was praying and we were starting to sense that God was doing something new with um, the group of people that we had been doing ministry with. Um, we were a couple of satellite campuses, we were meeting in a movie theater, and God was really moving on people's hearts um, in a way that was leading us into a new season. Um, he was calling us to be our own church. Uh, to be New Wine Church, and so we um, we just followed him, and we have been watching him do amazing things ever since. We knew that God wanted us to be a place where uh, heaven and earth come together, where people experience the freedom of Jesus and the um, welcoming of uh, of His love and. We were in a place though that didn't feel very much like heaven. Um, the movie theater was getting dirtier and dirtier. The chairs were breaking. Um, the space was getting harder and harder to work with. And uh, so at the beginning of 2022, we were able to move into Oak Park High School where we are now. Um, and he's been just doing so many amazing things in our Sunday services as we gather together to worship Him. Um, we are seeing people's lives changed. We are seeing um, just incredible um, new territory that He's taking week after week as we come together to worship. Oak Park has been amazing. You know, when we moved from the theater to the school, it was like a breath of fresh air. It was a place that we could gather that was clean, had plenty of space to spread out, and just the school itself was super accommodating to all of our needs. And it just has been almost like a new season for us as a church when we walked through the doors. Even though the school has been a blessing to us, there are challenges that we faced. So every single week, we, um, the worship team, sound media, we start set up at 6 a.m. and it is quite brutal, but everything has to be plugged in, turned on, all the cords have to be running to all the right places, um, and for us to have a successful worship service. It's really, really taxing on our volunteers. It's also really taxing on all of our equipment. Um, because we are simply handling and setting them up week after week and then also tearing them down. Each and every week, our kids and youth are meeting in spaces like gymnasiums, library, little theaters, and they're all great spaces, but none of them are designed in the way that we need to use them. Oftentimes at a moment's notice, um, if someone else is needing to use that space, um, our kids and youth are having to shuffle to a whole different area within the school um, just to accommodate that other group. The challenges of not having a long-term lease with Oak Park is just at a moment's notice, um, we could be asked to leave. And with a congregation of our size and New Wine Church is growing, it would be extremely hard to find a space at a moment's notice to accommodate all of us. Believe me, we have been looking for two plus years for the perfect space to accommodate all of us and it just simply doesn't exist. So one of the reasons why we want our own space is to not only you know help us with all of those challenges internally, but we are kind of hard to find. You know, being located in, the, located in the school, there's not a big sign across the side of the building that says New Wine Church meets here. Um, and so when you have new people coming in to try to find where, where we're meeting, where we're worshiping, it's just hard to find us. Um, and so having our own space would allow us to have roots planted, signage, um, there would be no discrepancy on where we're located um, and we would be easier to find. We're at this extremely important and exciting time at New Wine Church. As many of you know, at the end of last year, we bought a church property. We were able to pay cash for that property and we're getting ready to step into this time at our church called MOVE. What MOVE really is about is, is about moving us from Oak Park High School into the building and the land that we purchased. But there's some things that need to happen before we can do that. The current property only has 35 parking spaces. The sanctuary only seats about 100 um, people. It just cannot facilitate our church as it is right now. 
And so move is gonna be about getting that property where it needs to be for us to call it home. But I want you to understand move isn't just about a building or expanding uh, land. Move is actually about us becoming more and more like Jesus. And there's a few things I wanna share with you that we're gonna do during move that will cause us to become more like Jesus. The first thing we're going to do is we're all going to be called to pray. I know this for sure. Jesus was a prayer. When the disciples came to him and they could ask him any question that they wanted, they asked him in Matthew chapter 6, Lord, teach us to pray. They understood that everything Jesus did and everything that he was flowed from a place of prayer. The second thing is we're going to be asking people to commit. No one is more committed to you than Jesus is. He never gives up. He never stops loving. He's committed to us. And so we're going to be asking that you pray, listen to God, and you commit to whatever he's asking you to do. And the point is when we commit, we're like Jesus. And lastly, we'll be asking that we all come together and we give. At New Wine Church, we love the message of God's grace, but the central idea of grace is that God gave. We know everybody's favorite Bible verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And so the proper response to our God who so generously, joyfully, and willingly gave his son is that we be generous, joyful, and willing givers in response to him. As we begin to give towards move, it's going to take real dollars. And I want to share with you quickly what some of those targets look like. Our first target we're calling our midway target. It would allow us to expand the current 35 parking spaces to 190 parking spaces. The reason we call it our midway target is because that doesn't actually get us moved to the building. It's a huge step in that process, but we still need to add at least a, another nine to 10,000 square foot addition to house our current congregation. To make that target happen, we would need to raise $800,000 to finish our parking lot. Our next target, we're calling our move target because we would actually be able to move at that point. That would allow us to finish the parking lot uh, in target one, as well as add that additional nine to 10,000 square feet that we need for a sanctuary. We could also at that point add an elevator that we need to the current building so that there is access to the top and bottom floors for everyone. To reach that target, we need to raise $1.5 million. Our final target we're calling our miracle target because we need God to work in all of these, but we really need God to open the heavens for this one. But to reach our miracle target, it would allow us to renovate the current space, uh, pay down debt, perhaps add a fully functional room for a food pantry and outreach ministry services. And to reach our miracle target, we need to raise $2.5 million. All of this is only possible if we all come together, we join in, and we all participate in our mission at New Wine Church is on earth as in heaven. This is a huge part of accomplishing that mission. We just want to thank you all so much for being a part of that. We want you to know that God has great things ahead for you and great things ahead for our church as he moves and works and partners with us in bringing heaven to earth. You guys are real quiet. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Are you excited to be here on Vision Sunday? I hope you are. We have a, quite a bit to cover today, and I need you to help speed me up. You all know how to do that. I need you got to listen fast today. Um, hey, before we get into the Word, a uh, couple housekeeping things for you real quick. Our 2023 budgets are finally finished and finalized. took us a little longer than we had hoped because we 
purchased the building and property at the end of last year, like the tail end of last year, like December 20 something. And uh, so that kind of threw a wrench in our budget process. But if you uh, would like to look over that, our uh, finalized budgets are available for you at the welcome table out there. They're printed off and you can grab one of those. Secondly, you should have gotten a little card when you came in. If you didn't get a card and a pen, would you slip your hand up right now and someone will come around and make sure, oh, there's quite a few of you. Somebody will come around, keep your hand up, keep your hand up. Uh, if you need a card and a pen, they will come around and make sure you get those. At the end of service, we're going to have a moment where we all come forward and we write on this paper down here uh, what we're hoping God for, what we're having faith that God, faith for God to do in our lives. Um, and so I want you to take that card, be thinking about that, be praying about that. As you listen to the message, maybe something will spark in you. Go ahead and write that on your card so you don't have to spend time thinking about it as you're up here. Everybody got that? Understand what's going on? Uh, what we're going to do <clears throat> when we put what we're believing God for on these pieces of paper, we're actually going to take these pieces of paper and build them somewhere into our new building. Um, if fire code will let us, we'll put them in the walls. That might not happen, though, so we'll put it in the foundation or we'll put it somewhere. It's going to go somewhere. And the, the reason we're doing that is because we need to understand that this building and this project and where we're going is actually built on our faith in our God. And we're trusting that he's going to do it. Amen? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, we gave you these targets to give you something tangible. Those are kind of based off of what uh, a typical building and supplies and labor would cost. And so we need to give you something to see. But the truth is, this is about having faith that God's going to do it one way or another. Because you all know God can do anything. Yeah. So if he, has, if he brings the price down, if things are donated, whatever, we're just putting our faith that some way, somehow, God has called us to this. And so some way, somehow, he is going to make it happen. And so th that is what this is built on, our faith in him. So I encourage you, uh, you can write a name that, of a family member or a friend you're believing for salvation for. You can write uh, if you're believing for healing. If you're a part of our New Wine Church family, I encourage you pray about what you're believing God to do through this building project and through this completed building. And we're going to come together and write those down in a moment at the end of service. <clears throat> I've been thinking about move and stepping into building, and that's going to take people, it's going to take resources, it's going to take time, and I don't know if you guys know this or not, but I'll just kind of spill the beans to you. Uh, there's a lot of ways in church world that you can actually draw people and motivate people, and there's all kinds of books written about how to draw people and church growth statistics. And I don't read them uh, because I don't have much use for them, but if you read them, that's all good. Uh, but the reason I don't read them uh, is because, you know, people can be drawn because the coffee is good. And we have good coffee, so I'm not saying anything against that. And people are drawn because you have good, uh, great kids ministry. And because your kid's room looks like the jungle and they can swing and have fun while they're at church. People come to church because of that. And we have great, great children's ministry. We don't have the room that looks like the jungle, but, uh, you know, we've got something better. We've got Charla leading it, and she's awesome. So we have great kids' ministry. People are drawn to, uh, you know, just like the flashing lights and the production on the stage and the fog machines. And I don't know why people are drawn to this. <laughs> There's probably a psychologist that could tell me why. Um, but that, that draws people to church, and they come. They're like, oh, this is cool. This is like the concert I was at Friday night. And so they're drawn there. And I don't have anything against that. I think probably some of our lights flash. I'm not sure. Um, and, you know, the church I was trained at, they invented the flashing light and the fog machine. So I'm just telling you, I don't have anything against the flashing light and the fog machine. But on Vision Sunday... This is where we share the vision and where God's taking us and goals that we have and dreams that we have. And it's easy to just have your goals and dreams focus around numbers, like how many butts can we get in the seats and how many dollars can we get in the budget. And I just felt 
that I was really supposed to share with you my goal and hope that it becomes our goal this morning. And my goal, my one dream and hope is that people might once again be drawn here just for the presence of God. Not the flashy light, not the great kids ministry or the good coffee, but when people ask, what drew you to new wine? Why do you go to church there? That our genuine heartfelt answer would be, I don't really know, but when I walk in the doors, I know God is there. That would be what draws people here. Now, don't just let that be your answer because I just told you that. The goal is that that would be the genuine answer of our heart, that he is the center of all that we do here, and it is all about his presence in this place, that we are here for him, and we are happy, we are satisfied, and we are excited and thrilled that he is here to meet with us. And so I want to share with you a few things out of Haggai chapter 2, starting in verse 5, because I think there's some things that we can actually look at, and they can be markers for us to actually be our barometer for whether or not the presence of God really is the center of this place. Haggai chapter 2, starting in verse 5, it says this, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. Here's the first thing. In the presence of God, fear has no place. Fear is illegal in his presence. You know, the worst version of ourselves comes out when we're afraid. When we're in fear, that's when we're at our worst. I remember one time I was uh, on a walking trail with a group of my friends, the walking trail down by uh, Riverside. And part of that trail, uh, as you're walking, it kind of drops off into a pretty, pretty serious cliff. And that cliff goes straight down to the highway below. And uh, as we're walking on that trail at that p- particular section, y'all know I don't do snakes. I don't like snakes. Whatever snake phobia is called, I've got it. And so we're walking on this trail, and on the inner side, I hear a little rustle, and I see something slither by, and it's real close to my foot. And so I scream, and I start running the opposite way, kind of looking at the snake, and I just kind of get entangled with one of my best friends, and he's like, what are you doing? What's going on? He's freaking out, but I'm still running and screaming. And we're entangled, and I'm pushing him, and I almost run him just straight off the cliff down to the highway below where he would certainly die. Now, I want you to know, in my normal state, I don't think I'm capable of throwing one of my good friends off of a cliff down to the highway below. But in a state of fear, that just becomes natural. It's not something I'm even thinking about. And the worst of me comes out when I'm afraid. When we're afraid that people are going to withdraw their love from us or their relationship from us, when we're afraid we're not being valued, when we're afraid of not having enough, whatever your fear is, whatever gives you anxiety and worry in your life, know this, your craziest responses and actions are going to find their root in that fear. The worst version of you is going to grow from that place of fear. But the good news is, where God's presence is, there is safety. You're safe. I look out across this room and I have this feeling, many of you out there don't even know what that word means because of how you grew up or the situation you're in right now or the experience with church you had before. You're like, what is a safe place? Well, the safest place in the universe is the presence of God. Because the only fear that exists there is a fear of the Lord, which is awe and wonder at his power and his majesty. But at the same time you recognize his power, you know that because of his heart for you and his love for you and his grace for you, and that power is actually on your side, you can have this sense that I am safe. And so there is no reason for me to fear. And it's interesting to me how often I hear 
about staff members or board members at a church who are terrified to talk to their pastor about an issue they're having or their leader. You may be familiar with this feeling if maybe you're afraid to talk to your boss. Maybe you're afraid to talk to your dad or your mom. It's like the closer in you get, there's more fear. But if God is at the center, it's the complete opposite. The closer in you get, the more connected you are, there's less fear. And that's going to be the measure for us. Is God actually at the center? We'll be able to tell by looking at, do people actually feel a sense of safety? And is fear leaving? How y'all doing? Is this place safe? And when I talk about safe, I mean things like, hey, don't be afraid to pray. Some of you are afraid to pray because you don't feel like you know how and you think somebody will think you're stupid and you said the wrong thing. No fear. It's safe. God's not looking at you any differently, so nobody in here should look at you any differently. You're safe. Some of you are afraid to try to teach the Bible or say something about the Bible. No fear. If you say something wrong, so what? We'll help you, but we're not going to judge you for it. Because this place has to be safe. Now, safe doesn't mean safe to do whatever you want. Because there will be people who actually want to remove the presence of God from the center and put their comfort, their preferences, and their happiness at the center. Like, Matt, I didn't like when you said that. So I'm out. I don't like the music. This isn't how I would do it. I want my preferences at the center. And if you're going to do that, then you're actually threatening our safety that we get from the presence of God being the center. And you're going to be in for a rude awakening because that's not what we do around here. God's presence is at the center. And I'm not talking to any of you. Kim, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking about you all are awesome. I'm talking about a future problem that might arise and future people that might come, right? But God's presence will remain the center and we will be able to tell if that is actually true by the sense of safety and the sense of fear leaving this place. Let's keep going. Verse six. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. That's just saying I'm gonna do something. Anybody ready for God to do something? God to move in your life. Verse 7, I will shake all nations so that the desire of all nations will come in and will fill this house with glory. This is what I'm talking about. People actually have a desire, a want, and a need to encounter the desire of nations. That's Jesus. Now, they don't always know it yet, but that's really what people are longing for. And that's what we want people to be drawn into by the desire of nations, the presence of Jesus. Verse 8. Uh, This is not what my message is about, but it's a good one. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord. Uh, Just, you know, quick little reminder that it's all his. All your money is his. All uh, Joe Biden's money is his. All America's (laughs) money is his. It's all his. And it's amazing to me how weird people get. I mean, I've gotten weird about it too, so I'm including me in this. But it's weird how how, uh, irritated and frustrated people can get when you start talking about giving God back something that's already his. I mean, it's like if I let you borrow my car and then you got all offended when you had to give it back. That's what he's saying. This is all mine. The silver is mine. The gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. All right. Verse nine. This is really where I want us to get today. Haggai two, verse nine. This is the word of the Lord for this house, I believe. It says this, The future glory of this house shall be greater than the former. When when God's at the center, he takes us from glory to glory to glory. It's like he's got us set on these railroad tracks. This is like the purpose for every believer that you're headed forward for glory and more glory and more glory. Now you can stop 
and you can go backwards, but you can't get off of it. God's got this plan to take us forward into more and more glory. Now, I know some of you are wondering what in the world are you talking about when you talk about glory, because unless you're from the South, you probably don't use that word in your normal vocabulary. Y'all know what I'm talking about. They, they're always like, oh, glory. And it means, I think it means wow. I'm not sure. But what glory in the scripture means, in the original language, it just means weight or heaviness. In fact, there's this story in 1 Samuel chapter 4 about a priest named Eli. And Eli gets some bad news that his nation's been attacked and they've lost the battle, and he's so shocked and devastated by it that he flips out of his chair, and he lands on his head, and he dies. And you're like, how in the world did Eli the priest die from falling out of his chair? Well, the Bible tells you, it says Eli was a a glorious man. He was heavy, real heavy, full of glory. He was heavy enough that he landed on his head and it snapped his neck and he died. That's what happened. Glory means weight or heaviness. And when we're talking about the glory of God, we're talking about this reality that his presence can actually be uh, more here. It can be heavier in a place. Did you all know God can be more here? Let me explain it to you like this. It's pretty common Christian thought that God is everywhere at all times. The big word is omnipresent. He's all places at all times. And so in that sense, his presence is everywhere. But the scripture teaches us that when a person puts their faith and trust in Jesus, his presence comes and lives within them. And so he is more present in the life of a follower of Jesus. Jesus himself teaches us in Matthew chapter 18, where two or more of you are gathered, I am there with you. When we're together, he's actually more here than when we're apart. And so here's my shameless plug again for, mo- for many of you to actually make it a high priority to get to church because he's more present here. His presence is heavier here. Y'all being real quiet about this, but God can be more here. We talked about a few weeks ago, there is a type of praise and worship that we are invited to participate in, and God actually, his presence inhabits and dwells in a certain kind of praise. That praise where we sing our own song, we lift our voice, we learn it's called Tehillah Praise. It's the song of the people. That type of praise and worship God inhabits, and his presence is heavier in that type of praise. This is why we say prayers like, come Holy Spirit, because we know he's here. He's everywhere, but it's an invitation for him to be more here, heavier presence, weighty presence, Glory. How y'all doing? You get it? We get asked a decent amount about our structure here at New Wine Church, our leadership structure. Are you team led? Are you pastor led? Are you led by a board? And there are churches everywhere talking about restructuring their leadership model. Uh, Hillsong, the church I was at, they are in this huge time of doing this big restructure. And I think people really believe that there's a certain structure of leadership you can move to that is going to save you from any church scandal or any disgrace. And uh, it is February 26, 2023. I'm marking this date because I want them to check back in with me in 10 to 15 years and see how that is going. Because I know this, there is no structure that can save you from human sin and depravity. That is not the answer. Do y'all get that? Everybody needs to be not. That is not the answer. If you have an old white male as your leader, and I'm just picking that one out because I know the woke culture doesn't like them very much. (laughs) But if they're your leader and they look like Jesus and they're committed to looking like Jesus, 
you're going to be okay. If you've got a team or a board with all kinds of diversity on it and they all look like the devil, you're going to end up in the same place. The structure is not what is going to protect you or save you. And so here is our structure at New Wine Church, and this is what we have to all be committed to and move towards. Our structure is that Jesus is our head. God is in charge. Now you know the answer to the question, right? If anybody asks you, you say, God's in charge here. It's his house. He's our leader. And I know that sounds kind of abstract to people, but I want us to be committed to that because it's not abstract to me. Like I've got this little sticky note on my desk in my office at home where when I have a thought or an inspiration of how do we actually walk this out, that as God being our head, I write down a little idea I have that this is how we could practically do this. This is what it would look like. And it says things like, Matt, exclamation point, pray before you say or do anything. Because here's the thing, we so often just make decisions and say things off the cuff and we don't even ask God, what do you think? Now that doesn't mean like he just gives me a divine revelation about everything and everything is thus saith the Lord. In fact, it's pretty rare that I get real clear guidance on what to say or what to do. But what it's about is am I actually willing to give him the place I say he has? Can we say that he's Lord? Can we say he's in charge if we don't even consult with him or ask him what he thinks about something? Pray before you say or do anything. Uh, it says things like uh, get better at losing arguments. That's pretty practical. But here's the thing. Uh, if God's actually in charge and I'm not in charge or our leadership team isn't in charge, but if God's actually in charge, I don't have to be right all the time. Why would I have to be right about every little thing if God's actually the head. It says things like, don't give your opinion on everything. Now, some things may need my opinion, and some people may ask my opinion, but if God is in charge, I don't need to give my opinion, which oftentimes is just a way to try to manipulate things to steer towards my direction, by the way. That's why opinions are usually given. Um, But if God's in charge, there has to be things that I just say, you know what? I wouldn't do it that way. I don't like the way this is going, but I trust God's just going to get us where we're going because he's got the control and the wheel of this place and of my life. And so, you know, don't steal my ideas, but I think it's helpful to actually consider what would it look like if God's actually in charge here? And what would it look like if God's actually in charge of my life? I didn't share this one with first service, but I got more time second service, and I think this is a help. It's going to be a helpful one for somebody in here. But my little sticky note, it also says, um, let people do stuff you're good at. Yeah, because here's the thing. Like, Jen's really organized and great with the numbers and the business side, um, but if I'm being, and she, she covers all of that, but if I'm being honest with you, that's easy for me to let that go because I'm not good at it. I have no desire to do that, any part of that role. I don't want to talk on the phone. I'm not good at talking on the phone. I don't want to be in charge of responding to all texts and emails. I'm not good at that. The challenge comes in, will you let people do the stuff you're good at? Or will you let people do the stuff you think you're better than them at? Okay. I don't have anything else to say about that. That's just on my sticky note. That's for a few people out there just to chew on. Here's the fun part. When we're in charge, the best we can ever hope for, this is best case scenario. A lot worse things can happen, but I'm giving you the best case scenario because this is a day for celebration. But if we are in charge, if people are in charge, the best we can hope for and the best we will ever see is that we will celebrate the past. And we'll build monuments to the past and the great things that God did before. We'll remember this time when we were building a building and how awesome it was. And we'll remember this time when people's hearts were open to God and bodies were healed. And we'll always look back at the amazing things God did when we're in charge. And my little baby, Lily, 
Someday she'll grow up. She's in nursery for the first time today, so she's growing up real fast. But someday she'll grow up all the way, and she'll look back and she'll say, man, it was amazing what God did back then. She'll stand in our new building. She'll say, this is amazing that uh, the ones who came before us built this. But that will be the best we have. But if God is in charge, then he will lead us always into more and more glory. It's ever expanding outward into the future. And so if we stay committed to that, that Jesus is our head, then little baby Lily will stand up here and say, man, it was so amazing what God did back then. But he's doing even greater things now. That's what happens when the glory and the presence of God is at the center of what we do and he is our head. So we say, hey, we're here for you, God. Let this place be a place where the doors open and your presence is felt. And that's what people experience and that's what they are drawn to. Not anything else but your presence, Lord, and your glory. All right, tail end of verse 9. This is my favorite part, even though it's all good. He says, The future glory of this house shall be greater than the former. And in this place, in this place, the place where the glory is, I will give peace, declares the Lord. Where the glory is, that heavy, weighty presence of God, where the glory is, there is peace. Hebrew word shalom. Shalom, one of its meanings is safety, which brings us back to our first point. Shalom means safety, but its core meaning is wholeness. Wholeness. One thing that the scripture teaches us is that our world is broken. It's not in a state of shalom. If you look at this little piece of clay I have here, this right now is in a state of shalom. It's whole. But the Bible teaches us that our world is actually in pieces. It's not in a state of shalom. Our human experience teaches us very early on that not only is our world broken, but we're broken. Humanity's broken. And people have tried to find ways to deal with that brokenness for a long time because we all have this sense of, some call it emptiness, some call it loneliness, but again, the Bible just calls it brokenness. It's this thing that's hard to put our finger on. We can't always give a clear definition to it, but we are broken. And so people have tried to deal with that feeling and that reality forever. One of the most recent ways of dealing with it was uh, this thing called the Enlightenment in history. And people got all of this hope built up in, during the Enlightenment saying, well, we're broken, but we're actually getting better. We're getting fixed. We're moving towards a state of shalom. They didn't say that, but that's what they were saying according to the Bible. And through all of our medical advancements and our scientific discoveries, humanity's getting better. So we're going to get fixed. And then you hit World War I, and then not that long after, a, couple, a few decades later, you hit World War II, and the Enlightenment lost some steam because people had to step back and go, oh, wait a minute. We're actually just as broken as we always were. And so this period called the Enlightenment, it lost its momentum when it hit World War I, and it lost more momentum when it hit World War II, and we're at the tail end of the Enlightenment, and all of its steam has run out. People have realized we are broken. We're not getting fixed as we thought we were by our intellect and our great advancements in all kinds of sectors of society. And so now we're stepping into this time where people deal with their brokenness by denying it or getting, people, getting enough people to tell them they're not broken. And if somebody tells you you're broken, or if someone displays any brokenness, guess what, you cancel them, because we're not gonna bring any brokenness up. Because if we deny our brokenness, and if enough people tell us we're not broken, and if we get rid of anybody who looks like they're broken, and we get rid of anybody who says we're broken, somehow the world's not broken anymore. And that's just, 
hey, that's our current solution to our broken world. And so we live our lives in this broken state, whether we want to admit it or not. I saw a post on social media back when I was on social media last year. I'm not on social media anymore. Praise Jesus, he delivered me from that. <laughs> but this post said, the church has lied to you. You're not broken. You're loved, you're accepted, you're amazing, and you're whole. I said, you know, that's all great, but would you just stop and like really examine yourself a little bit and examine the world around you a little bit because we're just living in denial of brokenness. And we all have this sense that we're in pieces. And these pieces can represent anything. They can represent our world, like our whole human family. And all you have to do is look at the war going on with Russia and Ukraine, look at our political system, the division in our nation, look at our education system, pick your, pick your favorite one, and you'll, you'll quickly realize, oh yeah, humanity isn't whole. We're broken into pieces. We're separated. This is not shalom. This can represent your personality, your personhood. Because if you are a different person at work and you're a different person with your friends, and you're a different person when you come to church, guess what? Your personality is broken. It's not in shalom. This can represent our minds and our emotions. Our attention is drawn in so many directions these days. They said this on TV. They say this on my Facebook, Instagram feed. The newspaper says this, if any of you still read the newspaper. Our attention, our focus, our thoughts are torn in so many directions. It's in pieces. And so we go through life in this state of being broken apart. And what do we try to do? To, what do we try to do to cope with that? Well, we try to pull ourselves together, hold ourselves together. You know that phrase, right? Pull yourself together. And so I'm trying, I'm trying to get myself together. I'm trying to hold this all together. But guess what? I'm still falling apart. I'm trying to hold my marriage together and my kids together and my family together. But guess what? I'm still falling apart? Is there any answer as I try to hold myself together and put my pieces together? Is there any answer to get me back to a place of wholeness? Do you guys want the answer? Because yeah. I know your counselor, your therapist, all of these things that we try to do, they can get us to a place where we feel like we're together for a little bit but then we fall apart again. We can work through things with our spouse and work through things with our kid, and it goes okay for a while, but then we get to this place where we're falling apart again. And for so many, this is just life. Like, I'm not saying there's no good times, there's no happy times, but I'm just saying for people, the majority of their life is this feeling that I'm trying to hold myself together, but it all results in me just falling apart. Did I tell you all that glory means weight? And what God's word says is there's going to be a greater glory. It's going to be heavier, my presence. And where the glory is in that place, there's going to be wholeness. It's in his glory. It's in the weight of his presence that all those pieces are put back together. See, I can't pull these pieces apart anymore. This is whole. This is shalom. But the answer is to be in his glory. And that's what we're headed towards. That's what we need to be a place of, a place where his glory is, that weighty presence that brings wholeness to people and wholeness to our world. Are you all in for that? Yeah. Let's stand together. <clears throat> the
there may be someone in this room that this applies to. The thing that we've been torn apart the most from is our relationship with God. The Bible teaches us that, that we are separated from God. We are not in shalom with God. And heaven and earth were meant to be together, but they're actually torn apart and they are not in shalom. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 tells us this amazing news, that the Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory. What that means is that his life, and when he hung on that cross and when he rose from the grave, he is the glory. He, he had enough weight to bring us and God, earth and heaven, back together again in a state of shalom and wholeness. And so if you're in this place and you're saying, I, I am not connected to God, I don't feel uh, at peace with God, I don't feel, I definitely don't experience any uh, concept of heaven in my life, uh, I just want you to know that the Bible says all you need to do is put your trust that Jesus was enough to bring you back together, that when he rose from that grave, shalom was open to you, that you could be back in relationship with God. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to act right all the time. It's not about your behavior. It's just about Jesus. I trust that you had enough weight and you are the glory of God that you brought us back together. And so if that's you in this place, I just invite you uh, to say a quick prayer. Just believe in your heart. Jesus, I don't know how all this works. I don't understand it all, but I'm trusting that you were enough and that you did this for me this morning. We're going to move into this time where we bring our faith to God, where we believe him for things. And so parents, if you want to grab your kids, they should be back there. Just make your way and get your, get your kids as we partake in this moment together. what we're going to do is in just a second, we're all going to come forward. There are markers down here. And as I said, we're going to write what we're believing God for on this paper, on this wall. But I also want to encourage you, if that piece about falling apart and that piece about not being in a state of shalom spoke to you, that could be in your mind. You're suffering anxiety, depression. You're recognizing, oh, this area is broken. That could be in your relationships with your family. That could be in your body. My body's not in a state of shalom. It's broken. Then I want to invite you that uh, after you write what you're believing God for, just step off to the side or stay up front, and we are going to pray together Right, prayer team? You guys are going to help me out. We're going to pray that you encounter a greater glory in this place right now. Because the glory is what you need. It's God's presence in your life. And so I encourage you, if you're saying, yeah, that's me, I'm broken. And I've been having this hope that maybe something would come along that brought me into wholeness, but I gave up on that hope because nothing's working. God has this message for you today. It's found in his glory. It's found in his glory. You've been waiting. You got the answer. His glory brings shalom. So let's begin to make our way forward as the worship team prays and uh, let's celebrate this moment together. <laughs>